Support for Central Florida Public Media comes from JustCallMo.com and attorney Mo DeWitt, proud presenter of WMFE's Engage program. Mo DeWitt is committed to offering legal guidance in personal injury cases such as car accidents and slip and falls. Offices in Orlando. More at JustCallMo.com. Welcome to Engage, leading conversations that matter. Engage is made possible with support from inaugural sponsor, JustCallMo.com, and the support of listeners like you. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen, sitting in for Sharon Stone. Coming up, several federal judges have been regaled with free luxury trips, including Florida's Catherine Kimball Mizell. We'll talk with the Huff Post reporter who uncovered these junkets. Also, we'll look at the future of air travel with one of the state's manufacturers of vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, otherwise known as flying cars. And as we recognize the sacrifices of the soldiers who fought for freedom on D-Day, we'll speak with local historians about efforts to preserve the stories of veterans of all conflicts. But first. Worldwide, the price of oranges is skyrocketing, but as Florida's orange harvest season wraps up, data from the state's Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services show orange production is down more than 90% from the Sunshine State's peak in 2003. One major factor, a tree-killing disease with no cure called citrus greening. As Central Florida Public Media's environment reporter Molly Durig explains, researchers right here in our region are leading the search for solutions with genetic engineering technology. Steve Crump is a fourth-generation Volusia County farmer. He says oranges were always his family's main crop ever since 1883, when Crump's ancestors resettled here into Leon Springs from Illinois. But nowadays, Crump says his orange production is down 80 percent compared to 15 years ago. For that, he blames one thing in particular, citrus greening, a bacterial disease spread by the invasive Asian citrus psyllid insect. Most trees die a few years after being infected. Everything that should work and used to work isn't working it like it's supposed to. So Crump is getting creative. He takes me inside the best citrus screening defense he's come up with so far, a two and a half acre enclosed screen house he built about four years ago complete with roof and roll-up door. We're growing citrus inside to keep the insect out. Crump says the citrus trees in here grow much larger than they ever could outside this greenhouse, which so far is keeping out the invasive citrus psyllid. Or at least it was. This is unbelievably great way to grow trees until you have a hurricane and then the roof splits and the sides blow in and the bugs come. That's what Crump says happened in 2022 when hurricanes Ian and Nicole tore through the area just a few weeks apart. Back then, Crump had to repair the damaged greenhouse once, then twice. Still, he says he didn't notice anything wrong with these greenhouse trees until earlier this year. I saw citrus greening inside and some of the trees are infected. So that was discouraging. It takes about 14 months for the disease to show up in the tree. So I guess it was it was on schedule. At the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or UF IFAS, microbiology and cell science professor Nian Wong says his lab is the first in the world to develop citrus applications for the gene editing technology CRISPR. It can speed up the process. Wong says you can think of CRISPR as molecular scissors, which cut citrus plant chromosomes, trying to remove genes that make the plant vulnerable to citrus greening. You want to make sure, hey, you know what is responsible for the disease, right? So far, Wong says his team's narrowed it down to 40 genes that could be causing citrus greening. With CRISPR, the tricky part is removing those genes without harming other good genes, like ones that help a tree yield good quality fruit. I think we're getting close. Wong says earlier this year, his team took more than 120 CRISPR trees out of the lab, planting them in Central Florida fields to test their resistance to citrus screening. Final results are still a ways off. It is kind of a long, slow process of the disease development, right? But Wong is optimistic. So far, he says all the CRISPR trees in the field are doing well, not showing any signs of citrus screening. He hopes to know more about their long-term resistance to the disease next year. Well, we're going to drive just a couple hundred yards to an orange grove. Back at the DeLeon Springs farm, Steve Crump shows me one of the groves where he says his family first started planting orange trees more than 80 years ago. These orange trees used to live a long time. But citrus screening decimated those original orange trees, and today the ones growing in their place are much younger. 
Crump says right now he needs to remove about half of all of his trees after citrus screening made them unproductive. Meanwhile, as scientists keep searching for a citrus screening solution with CRISPR, Crump just hopes they can pick up the pace. It's very discouraging. I know how to grow an orange tree, or at least I used to know how to grow an orange tree. I really don't anymore. Molly Durig, Central Florida Public Media. And we are joined in the studio today by Molly. Molly, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Jamario. So in working on this feature, what would you say surprised you most in your reporting? I mean, really right off the top, it's the sheer amount that citrus production has plummeted, not just in Florida, but worldwide. Especially in Florida, though, I mean, citrus has been historically our crop, right? I mean, especially oranges. We've been responsible for like the majority of the country's citrus production, and that's changed in recent years. Hmm. So last year in 2023, it was the first year actually that Florida no longer was the state producing the most oranges. California took over. So it's just it's just really astounding how much it's plummeted. And really farmer after farmer that I spoke with, a lot of the scientists, citrus greening is behind it. So more than 90 percent down, basically here in Florida compared to the peak in 2003, 2004. So that was that was definitely a surprise. And then this isn't really like shocking exactly because there's lots of interesting research that goes on here in Central Florida. But it was really exciting to me to learn that Central Florida is literally ground zero for using CRISPR to address different kinds of citrus disease. UF IFAS professor Wong, who we just heard from, says his lab is the first in the world to develop CRISPR technology for citrus. So I thought that was really, really cool. That is really interesting. But Molly, I really wanted to ask you, you know, in in your reporting, uh, you point out that it'll be a long time uh, before scientists can present any big solutions to this problem. Why is that? It's a great question. And there are multiple reasons why. So first of all, science takes a long time, right? Especially the kind of long term reliable data that they need to be able to say with certainty, okay, yes, this works. This is a tree that is resistant to citrus screening that we can hand off to growers that more cases than non is going to work. They need to run experiments for that. They need to collect the data. That process takes a long time. There are other factors, though, contributing to the length of time. So citrus trees have an especially long, it's called juvenility, basically like the puberty period, juvenile phase. It's basically they can't grow fruit for seven, eight years of their life. So that takes some time because that's often how the signs of citrus screening are noticed whenever you start seeing signs on the fruit itself. And citrus greening itself is a disease that takes a long time to manifest. So I think, as we heard from Steve Crump, the hurricanes came, tore this greenhouse down. He built it, and it was like 14 months before he started seeing signs. And right on schedule, about 14 months after the hurricane. So you might think everything's okay and have no symptoms presenting on your trees. It takes over a year to show up. So there are several compounding factors for just why specifically this disease and these trees is is taking a while to come to a firm solution that's going to work more mm-hmm. times than not. That makes a lot of sense. And to play devil's advocate, do we know how long it may take to find out? You know, I think that Professor Wong gets his question a lot. And, you know, actually during our interview, it was very, very kind of him. He actually kind of apologized to me, he said, you don't have to apologize to me. He said, this takes a long time. And I mean, simply... The idea is that it'll be worth the wait because at the end of the day, you're going to have that long-term reliable data and you're going to be able to say with certainty, okay, this works. But basically, right now, Wong's hope is to have CRISPR trees resistant to citrus screening ready by next year. So just earlier this year in March is when they finally brought them into the field to plant them to see really how is this going to work. So far, so good. But as we just heard, you know, it can take up to 14 months for the symptoms to show up. So they don't really know yet. He's hoping next year. A uh, little little side note there. He says they already do have CRISPR trees resistant to a different kind of disease, citrus canker. That's already done. Those trees are fully approved and can be handed off to any growers in Florida who want them. That's another disease that causes a lot of issues for people, but not quite to the level of citrus screening, which has really decimated the industry. So that's exploring the issue from, of course, the scientific perspective. Uh, but to, I guess, expand on that a little bit further, those who are out in the field with these trees, right? Steve Crump's solution uh, was to build an indoor enclosure for his trees, right? To keep out the insects, keep out the disease, right? Keep them safe. And I I love that solution. Uh, But I'm wondering, you know, how common of a solution is that in his industry? And is it among the extreme solutions that you encountered in your reporting? Yeah, so I didn't meet anyone else with a screenhouse, but not to say that there aren't others with screenhouses. 
other solutions that I heard about, one really interesting one is this kind of like oak mulch concoction that some farmers are mm. using. It's sort of like it's it's been described as like a tea of fresh oak leaves and water. And the idea is to kind of replicate the effect of a citrus tree standing under like an oak canopy in the rain. There's certain things that are released from the leaves when it rains. And, and some farmers have found success with this oak mulch tea concoction with their citrus trees. Some other farmers have reported that didn't do anything for them. So, again, this is a disease right now with, with no surefire cure. But the oak mulch is helping. Antibiotic injections are helping some farmers. Of course, some folks have concerns with injecting antibiotics into our environment, but those have shown signs of success. Certain kinds of citrus trees might just be more resistant than others, and that's really what the genetic engineering experiments are looking at, like what, which kinds of citrus trees are more resistant and what genes go into that whole process. But certain kinds of trees, they're trying to narrow it down on that. And there's also like quarantine areas the federal government sets, and there's designated areas where, okay, we know citrus greening is in this area. Don't bring any branches or trees from that area anywhere else because it's going to spread. So these are just so far what I've learned about people are using to try to mitigate the disease. Molly Durig is an environmental reporter here at Central Florida Public Media. To find out more about citrus greening, uh, take a look at her feature at cfpublic.org. Molly, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Great to talk with you. Coming up, a look at the technology driving Florida's flying car industry. And later, we'll look at how historians are attempting to collect the stories of the few remaining World War II veterans. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen, and you're listening to Engage. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen, sitting in for Sharon Stone. Sharon will return next week. Ahead on the program today is the commemoration of the World War II D-Day landings as we observe the 80th anniversary of the Allied invasion. The youngest World War II veteran who would, will attend the, the commemoration tomorrow is 96. And there are a couple dozen and most of them are centenarians. And so that is amazing. And it's wonderful that they get to be there. We'll talk with an area historian about remembering the ones who sacrificed everything and the veterans who suffered in silence. But first, research from Custom Market Insights is estimating the vertical takeoff and landing aircraft industry and how it could grow to a $70 billion industry inside of eight years, a trillion by 2040. Vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, you probably know them as flying cars, are being positioned to infiltrate the private and corporate aircraft industry with its sights on mass transit and cargo shipping. The crafts themselves resemble space-age sky cars, part drone quadcopter in part 80s sci-fi spaceship. Florida is jockeying for a foothold in the industry with plans for vertiports, takeoff and landing structures peppering the Atlantic coast. Several startups have taken root in the Sunshine State, including Pompano Beach's Doroni, which is preparing to roll out the H1X flying car with a tentative price tag around $350,000. We asked Doroni's chief of marketing and investor relations, Abe Datz, to join us to join us to talk about his company and the future of flying cars. I began our discussion by asking Datz to describe his company's product. The Doroni H1X is a compacted two-seater can carry up to 500 pounds of payload aircraft that's using drone technology combined with sensors, ballistic parachute, multiple redundancies for safety that will allow flying from point A to point B in a lot more efficient and more exciting way that we're used to, you know, with traditional cars and even helicopters and planes. Our goal with the H1X is to make it super easy and customer centric. The user interface should be just like a five-year-old will be able to get in and figure out how to fly with it. I know a lot of people have questions about technology. Oh, we were promising for the hundreds of years, flying cars, you know, since we grew up. But at this moment in time, as you see the evolution of electric cars, drone technology, the battery industry, delivering some crazy technology and with AI and all these new advanced technologies that we didn't even have three years ago or four years ago, you know, are becoming now available is actually allowing us to build a super compact vehicle that will be affordable 
and easy to fly and open up the airspace to people that weren't familiar with flying or will create a whole new generation of pilots into this new industry. So the H1X, it's powered fully electric. So it has eight vertical electric motors that will take you up vertically straight up from your rooftop or from your driveway, wherever you're going to park them. You go up vertically straight like a drone. And then you have two pushers in the back that once you hit your altitude, it will transition into a forward flight, turning on the back pushers and will glide you on their wings. And we built it in a very simple design as well, that there shouldn't be any moving parts, anything rotating. So the only things are rotating or spinning on the vehicle are the props and the electric motors in the back. Very easy, very comfortable, panoramic views from your city, overlooking, you know, wherever you are. I live in Miami, so I'm excited to be able to see, you know, beautiful views. And you're right about the excitement. I think, you know, so many of us have thought about the ideas of flying cars and have been swept in that excitement before, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, for the the more cautious uh, of those of us who have thought about this idea, uh, you know, what about safety concerns? About what, a in the event of engine failure, what mechanisms are in place to keep the passenger safe? Yeah, great question. So safety, as you can imagine, is the number one concern for us, right? Because we know this is a new thing. And the first thing that we have in our design was, okay, how do we make this super safe, something that's safer than any traditional airplane or helicopter? So we knew we have to put in a lot of redundancies. So for example, we have eight vertical motors and each duct if you can see an image behind me, there's two fans, two propellers, redundancy. If one fails, the other one can take over and you have it in each duct so you can have up to four fail and still land safely. Then we have a ballistic parachute. In case of everything fails, you can pull the ballistic parachute and we'll land the whole vehicle. On the computers, you have many backups. On the batteries, there's reserves. Every detail of the vehicle, the, the, the carbon fiber, airframe everything is designed for safety and make people feel very comfortable and also what people like for example helicopters people don't you when you're in a helicopter you hear the noise it's vibrating and you know it, it feels very unstable right what we're introducing the new technology our, our new technology is it's it's going to be quiet it's going to be very stable because you have a, a just like a drone it stabilizes itself right so as a pilot, all you got to do is use a joystick. So it's very stable and it will also give that feeling. It's not just being safe, it's also feeling safe. So when you sit in it, you feel like you're on a cloud, on a flying carpet. Who would be piloting these? Uh, what kind of training or certification uh, would drivers require? It's not yet 100% confirmed because the eVTOL space is a new category and the FA is still developing it. We're working very closely with all their companies, gathering all the data and still building out the framework. But from what the conversations are, we understand it will be equivalent to LSA, a sports pilot license. So that's about a 20, 25 hour course, you know, learning the aerospace regulations and flying in a simulator for a couple of hours. But you need to have a driver license, just like a regular, I think you gotta be 16 years old or something and a 20 hour course will be able to fly it. In case you're just joining us, I'm Joe Mario Pedersen sitting in for Sharon Stone, who'll be back next week. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. Right now, we're talking to Abe Datz, head of marketing and investor relations over at the Pompano based Doroni Aerospace. And we're talking about flying cars. So House Bill 981 died in the state Senate this year, despite passing the House, right? And the bill would have designated the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority as the state's testing hub for advanced air mobility, and it would have established baseline regulations regarding the development of vertiports in Florida. So how does this impact statewide distribution, and how do EVATOLs, and more specifically, Doroni, how does it affect all of that? I believe that Florida should focus on this next generation of vehicles, because this is the future. It's not a might be, this is. You see it in China, you see it in other countries, and they are ahead of us. Chinese companies are ahead of us. Do they have a better product? It's probably not, but 
in this industry, they're already flying, they're getting regulated, and the government is backing it really strongly. And this will be in the next five to 10 years. This is a race, which country is going to develop the best technology in the EVTOL space. So I believe there's no reason why Florida should not take advantage of this new industry and you know build a whole new economy around it and ultimately be the hub of the EVTOL industry. You mentioned uh, mass production there. I'm wondering, you know, how far away are these vehicles from the consumer market? Uh, when do you think we'll start seeing these in the sky? By 2026, we'll have a few of them already flying. There is a lot of things that need to go right. You know, the regulation, funding is a very important for us to secure funding to bring this to mass production. A lot of R&D, a lot of testing. You know, there's a lot that needs to get done, but we're very confident with our team and everyone else in the industry that it's going to get done. The question is, is, is going to be in a two years from now, three years. We're not talking about 20 years. This is, this is here around the corner. Who are these vehicles for at the end of the day? Uh, will this industry exist for the same people who use private jets and corporate helicopters? A, a big portion of that, um, you know, we see, you know, we got a lot of our pre-orders from people that own private jets or people that have smaller planes and also for a lot of people that have never been in the aviation place but this is something like you know something new to them and the businesses think about corporate you know for managers that need to get from one facility to the next facility for inner city for like you know 50 to 100 mile range this will really change the game for, the, for these type of people Abe Datz is the head of marketing and investor relations for Deroni. In April of 2022, the U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell for the Middle District of Florida ruled that a Biden administration policy requiring the wearing of masks while traveling would be struck down. The country was more than two years into the COVID pandemic, and masks were at the time identified as the primary method of reducing the person-to-person -person transmission of the virus. The wording of the ruling was unusual as was the timing, as it had come soon after Judge Mizell had attended multiple all-expense-paid junkets with a number of other federal judges. Destinations included Orlando and a posh golf resort in the mountains of West Virginia. The purpose of the trips was to engage the attendees in a workshop re-examining applications of arcane judicial theories. Molly Redden is a senior political reporter with HuffPost. Her reporting uncovered a web of PACs, judges, and legal theorists. She joined us earlier to unpack her findings, and I began our conversation by asking Redden exactly what made this 2022 mass decision by Judge Mizell so unique. What made this decision unique and a little unusual is that a primary part of the reasoning why she said the CDC didn't have legal authority to enforce a mask mandate was she took a look back at the law from the 1940s that gave the CDC a lot of its powers and read that it had rules to enforce sanitation measures. It could make sanitation rules. And she went looking for a definition of sanitation. She found several, but she used a big academic search engine and that one returned a really specific definition in, in her belief, which was that sanitation only means to clean something and masks don't clean anything. At best, they you know hold in droplets. And so she decided masks aren't sanitation. CDC can only make sanitation rules and therefore the CDC couldn't enforce this rule. And, and that's what effectively ended the Biden administration's federal transit mask mandate. And that was unusual just for some context, because uh, usually judges look at a whole host of previous court decisions and different ways to interpret statutes. This was very specific and narrow. And to a lot of critics, it looked like she went looking for a definition that would allow her to strike this mandate down. Exploring that a bit more, what brought her to this ruling. Can you explain uh, legal corpus linguistics? And has this been a traditionally applied legal philosophy? 
No, legal corpus linguistics is a fairly new way of interpreting legal statutes and constitutional law. What it is, corpus linguistics involves Latin, but really all it means is that you are looking at, like I mentioned, a large search engine of how words and phrases were used throughout history. Uh, it's, a, it's an older tool in the field of linguistics when linguists want to know more about how a word has been used. Uh, they go looking at examples of historical text. But there's this new concept that you could use that to interpret the law, and that's why they call it legal corpus linguistics. And what it's for is trying to understand how a law would have been understood by the people passing it and by the people reading the law at the time that it was passed. And if that sounds familiar, it's because these more conservative concepts that people have probably heard of, like originalism and textualism, they rely on this idea of interpreting the law as it was understood by the public at the time of its passage. And so that's why legal corpus linguistics is a useful concept. It, it's not by itself an ideological concept, but a lot of conservative legal scholars are seizing on corpus linguistics as a new way to interpret the law because it's another way of rooting legal interpretation firmly in the past without any modern interpretation or modern considerations of how the law might operate. Molly, uh, at the end there, you, you brought up uh, the those who are for uh, legal corpus linguistics. And I was wondering if you could explain uh, who the proponents of this philosophy are and you know, why are they footing the bill for an all-expense-paid luxury trip for federal judges? So for the reasons we just discussed, uh, a lot of the proponents of this concept are very conservative. Looking to history and tradition has become a really popular conservative mode of interpreting the Constitution. That has to do with why Roe v. Wade was struck down and some recent uh, gun rights restrictions were struck down by the Supreme Court, this concept of history and tradition. And corpus linguistics is kind of a useful way of rationalizing how we look at history and tradition. You know, oh, we researched it in a big pile of historical texts. And critics of corpus linguistics would say that's why it's useful to the conservative legal movement. And that's why it would make sense for very conservative groups like the Koch Network and Donors Trust, which foot the bill uh, for these retreats, uh, would foot the bill for those retreats. Molly, as far as these retreats go, can you uh, describe them a bit further? What kind of trips were these? So they take place at really desirable destinations. Two of their retreats so far have taken place at a big luxury resort called the Greenbrier. It's in the hills of West Virginia. It spans like 11,000 acres. It has four golf courses. It's a really nice place to spend a week. Uh, another one took place in Deer Valley, Utah, which is a really exclusive ski resort. Uh, that's where Gwyneth Paltrow uh, had her ski collision that she was in litigation over. If people remember that trial, uh, that's where that took place. It's a really Tony place to, to spend a week on someone else's dime. I'm wondering, Molly, you know, as far as in your reporting, what kind of response did you get from Mizelle or any of the attending judges or the sponsors of these trips? We didn't hear from Mazelle or the sponsors for this story. When I previously reported on this group at, that was organizing these trips in March, they did respond and they deny that there is any ideological bent to these trips. They say it's purely um, an educational and academic exercise. I think something that throws skepticism on that is the fact that Almost all of these trips are attended almost exclusively by very conservative judges that mostly President Trump appointed to the federal bench. Wondering also about the opinions of this application uh, from the academic legal community. What are they saying? 
So I think there's some recognition that corpus linguistics could be a useful tool for any judge. You know, judges really are asked to figure out what a word means in context. And one thing we mean by context is not just how is the rest of the law written and how have judges been interpreting a given kind of law throughout history, you know, in precedent, but also what did that word mean when the lawmakers wrote it down? And, you know, that is a part of judicial interpretation. I think what troubles people is that, first of all, corpus linguistics, as it was developed by actual linguists, there's a really specific way that you're supposed to use these tools and actual linguists train for years and, you know, debate, like, what do these results mean when we plug them in? And so there's an argument that a judge who just gets a couple of days of training and how to use this very powerful search engine isn't actually applying it in the way that the people who developed it meant for it to be used. Uh, and then also, I think they're seeing, and I think this ruling by Mazelle is a very good example, that corpus linguistics, if you use it cynically, can just be another way of cherry picking your history and your evidence to find the answers that you're looking for in the first place. Molly, could you tell us whether or not there's been any pushback regarding uh, this this application? No, there hasn't really. You know, I don't think the Senate would play a role in telling judges how to use this tool. The role of the Senate, specifically the Senate Judiciary Committee, would be to talk to the Judicial Conference, which is the body inside the federal judiciary that makes rules for when judges can attend fancy seminars and what kind of reporting they're supposed to do, and ask questions about how they're enforcing those rules and whether the rules are adequate. So there's sort of two issues. You know, one, the judicial conference rules for when judges can attend these all expenses paid seminars are pretty lax. They leave it up to judges themselves to decide, is this a bad look? Does this look like I'm just accepting a luxury trip for being a good ideological judge? And it's, you know, really up to them to make the gut call. And there are no rules against judges attending really outwardly or obviously ideological or obviously favor-based seminars and luxury trips. And then second of all, you know, the Judicial Conference has rules around when you're supposed to disclose when you've attended these trips. But there was some good NPR reporting in April that not a lot of judges are disclosing their attendance on time. And also the Judicial Conference itself takes a really long time in vetting and posting these reports that show us when judges have attended these conferences and what sort of trips judges have accepted, there's really big delays. And that's just because the judicial conference has been slow to post them. And so the Senate Judiciary Committee could ask questions. They, they could demand that the judicial conference answer some questions about, is this adequate? What's going on here? But so far, they've declined to do that. Molly Redden is a senior political reporter with HuffPost. Coming up, as we acknowledge the 80th anniversary of D-Day today, we'll learn more about efforts to record the stories of veterans of World War II and the challenges of maintaining the memories of veterans from all conflicts. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen. This is Engage. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen, filling in for Sharon Stone. Today is the 80th anniversary of the Allied forces infiltrating the beaches of Normandy in what was described as the largest amphibious invasion to ever take place in military history. The World War II operation converged Allied armies of land, sea, and sky. 
Earlier today, veterans, world leaders, and supporters met on the codename beaches of Utah, Omaha, and more in commemoration of the sacrifices made by the soldiers who stormed into the then Nazi-occupied France. According to the Associated Press, there were 4,414 soldiers who died on D-Day. There were over 16 million Americans who fought in World War II, but those numbers have shrunk significantly over the last 80 years. Today, there is little over 114,000 American World War II veterans alive. According to the Florida Department of Veteran Affairs, 11,000 of them call Florida home. I sat down with Dr. Amelia Lyons, a history professor at the University of Central Florida. She leads the Florida France Soldiers Stories Project, which has students document Floridians who served in the European theater in World War II, died in service, and were buried in one of five World War II cemeteries in France. I began the conversation by asking Lyons what we lose from the World War II record as the number of living veterans become smaller and smaller. Having been in the room and heard many World War II veterans speak about their experience, there's something about the personal connection that is missing when you're not there in the room. And whether it's a a veteran of D-Day or any other experience, I know when I've had students have the opportunity to be in the room with a veteran, what I tell them is that years from now, they won't remember me but they will remember this person and they will remember this story, that it really captures it in a way that very little other can. But I think the work we are doing now with the American Battle Monument Cemetery and with the National Cemetery Administration allows us to to capture those stories now that for many of this generation, we can no longer tell them from the first person perspective. You mentioned that the uh, the work that you're doing now, the American Battle Monument Cemetery, uh, can you tell me more about that? So we have two projects at UCF that deal directly with these stories. And one is called Florida France Soldier Stories. And students in my history methods class write the biography of a Floridian who served in the European theater in World War II and who died in service and is buried in one of five World War II cemeteries in France. So it it allows students to learn research methods and how to bring together primary and secondary sources in a narrative format and something that is possible in a semester because they're doing something small about one individual. But for us, it matters so much more because the students derive this intimate connection with the person they study. They learn about the history of Florida, they learn about the history of France, they learn about the history of the war, they learn about service and sacrifice, they learn about a gold star family uh, because we have them talk about the legacy and they they see this as their person, their veteran. And you know, I have so many stories. One, I remember during COVID when we were meeting in Zoom and a student had printed out a photograph she had found of her veteran and and she held it to her cheek and she said, he didn't get to be a grandpa. And so I'm going to make him my grandpa. Right. That, That it's a very intimate bond that students have and they learn so much and they often will say they learn so much more through this kind of work because it forces them to link the context to the individual experience. And that's such a a wonderful way to learn about history and to learn about how it matters on an individual level, that it's not just about huge numbers that sometimes just don't mean very much. Uh, Of the vets that you've you've spoken with, you know, what what would you say is the most important thing uh, that they want to be heard or or learn from in these stories? I, I think it's that those who survive conflict and combat want us to remember those who did not. The difference between Veterans Day and Memorial Day is incredibly important. And that it's it's so important that we memorialize those who do not survive the war. And it is, I think, a little bit different than in the in the US than in a lot of other places. Many national cemeteries around the world are only for the war dead. And I do think it is so important that in the U.S. 
the war dead and veterans who survived the war and live long lives and contribute to their communities and to our country long after their service can choose to be buried alongside the war dead. But I, I think that sometimes that means that we don't think about just those who have made the ultimate sacrifice as much as we do think about all veterans. And I think for so many, it's that idea that their life's work becomes making sure that those who perished are not forgotten. And I think for me, especially with Florida, France, which focuses only on those who did not survive the war, it, it comes back to growing up in a military family. My dad served in Vietnam and is now buried at Arlington. You know, both of my grandfathers served in the Second World War. One is also buried at Arlington near my father. And, and I know that for those veterans who did live long lives and got to do so many other things, so much of what they did reflected a, a desire to help those who either didn't survive or who struggled in my you know my father did a lot of work in his lifetime for addicted veterans of the vietnam war and after and so i think it's that idea that that we have to care for those who served and remember those who didn't make it home i do have one more question here that i wanted to uh cross uh, Dr. Lyons, uh, how would you characterize the 80th anniversary since D-Day, since as opposed to previous anniversaries that we have observed? It's interesting in a number of ways. I think that the early anniversaries were focused on the highest levels of the chain of military command and the honored people, of rightly so, Eisenhower and others, um, but you didn't see the rank and file soldier and sailor who fought as a part of that story. And it's really in the 80s and 90s when that starts to shift. Part of that, I think, probably was the 50th anniversary. I think there was a lot of media attention. And it's when more scholarship on these questions about the, the social history and the cultural history become a part of the story. And, and, you know, it's not until the year 2000 that Congress creates the mandate for the Veterans History Project, which is the national project to collect oral histories, which UCF has been doing since 2009. And we have probably close to a thousand oral histories with uh, veterans. Dr. Barbara Gannon, our colleague, runs that program. I've even from the very beginning, did it in my class with World War II veterans. And part of the reason I shifted to this biography project was that we were running out of veterans that we could do interviews with. Um, and we were needing to do them from other conflicts. And, you know, because of my own interest and focus, I wanted to stay with World War II. And so I, I think that shift really took place in the last decades of the last century and now into this century. And and so I, I think I read somewhere that the youngest World War II veteran who would, will attend the, the commemoration tomorrow is 96. And there are a couple dozen and most of them are centenarians. And so that is amazing. And it's wonderful that they get to be there. But I think it's also for those of us who can't get there on the 80th, because it, be, it also becomes so difficult to go for these kinds of huge celebrations. You know, for your listeners, if you get to go, I went with my grandfather on a quiet day in November, you know, in the year 2000, and he had fought in the Pacific and he wanted to go there and he wanted to, to see it and to be there because his brother-in-law had fought there. And those kind of days when you are in these places, if you can go to a national cemetery here in Florida, or if you get to go overseas and get to go to an American cemetery overseas, go, go to anyone that you can go to, because it's such a moving experience to see that landscape where all of our veterans are treated with the same dignity, no matter branch or rank, with those white headstones, right, that are a symbol for ourselves and for the world of the respect that we have for those who serve. 
I think whether it's the 80th anniversary or you can't be there for it, go if and when you can. Dr. Amelia Lyons is a professor of history at the University of Central Florida. That's all for today's edition of Engage. You can learn more about today's program by visiting our website, cfpublic.org. I'm Joe Mario Pedersen. Sharon Stone will be back with you next week here on Engage on Central Florida Public Media. Thank you for joining us. All Things Considered is coming up following NPR News.